Okay, this is another little side trip on 1 Peter. Here we're going to focus on verses 10 and 11 from an exegetical and doctrinal standpoint rather than the meter. Because one of the things to find out is, first of all, what's the correct interpretation of the verse? And that would shed light on what kind of meter I'd be looking at. I'm also looking to find historical references to the time that Peter's referencing by means of his meter. And I'm kind of having a tough time there. So if I have enough time in this video, I'm going to cover that too. First of all, this is one of the most disputed verses in theology. And I have no idea why it's so disputed. I mean, usually when there are theological disputes, it's because there's a mistranslation. And sure enough, that's what we got here. See, person. That is not in the Greek. Not in it. Forget it. See, here's the Greek. What sort of is the way that ought to be translated? Okay? What sort of time? Chiron means time. Kairos is the vocabulary form. That's all it means. What sort of time? This means sort of right here. Boyo. So you can see in the lower left hand corner you got some of the lexicons. I mean it's UBS and Freiburg, but it doesn't get any really different. See B Dag. What class or kind? What sort of? Be the best English, idiomatic English. Okay? What kind? What's the nature of it? What's the kind? What's the classification? Okay. So Poyon is not at all like Tina. Tina comes from Tis. This is Tina. It comes from Tis, and yes, usually when it's in the masculine singular, like here, if that's all that there was, then you could argue it referred to a person. But it isn't by itself. It's in a phrase, see? What sort of time? That's the only thing it means. It doesn't mean anything else. Okay? Now right there that clears up a lot of the debate over this verse. Okay? Because in context, now we have to go back to verse 10. In context, the prophets. That's right here. The prophets. This is how Peter should have begun his sentence. But he's doing it in reverse order because he's tying to Paul's syllables. Okay? The prophets who prophesied of the grace that will come to you. Okay? This is Old Testament prophets. Not New Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets. Because what is he talking about? The grace that will come to you. Actually, the word would come isn't in the text. See? Perites es humas haritos. Okay, so it's just of the grace to you. Forget this, just throw this out. Somebody stuck that in to try and make it make English sense. You don't need that. The grace to you, what is the grace to you? Grace to you, church. In other words, we're post cross. The prophets knew there was going to be a group pro post cross. They wanted to know more about that time. Okay, I mean, Daniel's a real good example of this. When you read in Daniel 10 through 12, it's all talking about post-cross. Daniel wanted to know. So Daniel's an example. It's Old Testament. Okay? And why is this about the grace to us? Because we're post-cross, number one. And the question was, you know, really would... Israel accept him and that was like not not you know how do you want to call it God didn't say anything he was silent on that topic that's why Daniel 10 through 12 reads the way it does it was sort of ambiguous whether Israel would accept Christ or not so then what was going to come afterwards if, if Israel didn't accept him why is this such a big deal I mean you can't believe how much is on the internet about this there are 900 prophecies about, you know, the light to the Gentiles. Hello? Harvesting the Gentiles was supposed to come after Christ died. 
It would still, you know, had the church not been church, had, had Israel accepted Christ, there still would have been 50 years of harvesting the Gentiles. And the ancient prophets wanted to know what that was like. Daniel being an example in explicit text through Daniel 10 through 12. So what's the big whoop here? Why is everybody so confused? Oh, they made diligent inquiries. They didn't know. Yeah, Daniel didn't know he was reading Jeremiah at the time he spoke Daniel 9. He says so in, Jer in Daniel 9 too. God gave him a lot of prophecy. In other words, the prophets. What does prophetes mean? See, here's the verb. Profetuo. The first meaning of prophet means to teach. Foretelling and forthtelling is the way my pastor liked to talk about it. Forthtelling is sending forth the Bible as then written and revealed to the people. Foretelling would be that portion of future scripture. In other words, hi, this thing's going to happen. That's scripture too, but it's about the future. Future to what? Compared to the group being talked to. So da Daniel got, you know, the prophecy about the Medes and the Persians, the prophecy about Rome with the feet of clay. So he was a prophet. In fact, you know, a whole lot of people learned under Daniel. I would bet you money that Zoroastrianism comes from Daniel, from the time of Daniel. That it's a twist on what Daniel taught. Because Daniel was known for knowing scripture. He was known as a prophet. Okay, but we find that Daniel's examining scripture himself in Daniel 9 too. He's reading Chronicles, he's reading Kings, because Chronicles was written by Jeremiah contemporaneous to him, and the book of Jeremiah was written contemporaneous to him, and he was reading from Jeremiah 25 and 29 when he starts Daniel 9. So why is this verse so confusing to, to everybody? I mean, the basic arguments are, well, if they're prophets, they shouldn't have to ask questions. Sure, they should. They should be asking more questions than everybody else. See, they get to become prophets because they know Bibles so well. They get to write scripture because they know Bibles so well. Well, you can't know Bible very well if you're not searching and studying it, can you? See, this comes from Zetel. I'm seeking and searching to know answers about, about something my pastor said. About how God orchestrates time. My pastor always saw it that believers are used by God to buy time for the world. And I, I asked him about that in the year 2000, like, what is this doctrine? How can I prove it in scripture? Because my pastor was getting sick at that time and he didn't provide as much proof as I felt I needed in order to stand before God and, and believe it. Because, you, you know, you, you, you listen to your pastor, you take his word for things, but you're not, you know, your pastor's not responsible for what you believe. Even though he's your teacher, you're responsible for what you believe. You don't just swallow everything a teacher says. Okay, so I went to scripture. Where, Dad, in scripture is this stuff about believers buying time? And that was back in the year 2000. I've been documenting it ever since. Okay, and I'm not a prophet. Okay, but now I have all this Bible Hebrew meter stuff that the scholars don't know. That's why I'm scared about, oh, I shouldn't be, but I am scared about dying. But dying with this knowledge going with me. Okay, that's a sin on my part, probably. All right, 1 John 1, 9. Hey, Dad, I shouldn't be afraid. All right, so now, searching. If you're a prophet, you would be a, you should be a Bible expert. So searching, asking, seeking diligently is exactly what you should do. So what what's with this argument that, oh, well, something's wrong with one Peter. They, they, they are prophets. They shouldn't be looking into anything. No, they should be looking more than the average guy because they're prophets, because it's their job to teach Bible, and it's their job to prophesy the future also. So they should be Zyteoing more than everybody else. See, this is Zyteo right here. ex -o is a, makes it a stronger verb. Ek just means out from, away from, separated from. Like when you see um, ek koilia in the Bible, Old Testament or New, it means outside the womb, not in it. 
it's always translated inside when it should be translated outside. Ek means outside, away from, separated from. So you're searching out. See, zeteo means to ask, to seek, to search. Ek, to search out. All right? It's very simple. All right? And then here we got the other version of it. Okay? And that's an ek with when you have another vowel in front of it. it turns into exz. Ex around Aronao. Ex Aronao. Okay? That's what prophets are supposed to do is make careful searches. Or they're not good prophets. So what's the big whoop here? Why is everybody so nervous? Okay? And yeah, they're making they're searching scripture and they're asking God, which is what every believer is supposed to do also. So what why is there's so much brouhaha over this verse. I don't know. Can't search it out because it makes no sense that people would have trouble with this verse. Okay, so now we go back to verse 11 because something seems missing to me here. Like a verb is missing or a prepositional phrase or something. I could be wrong about that. I just That's just what it strikes me right now. Okay? And then he repeats the verb. Eranontes. Okay, see, search, examine down here. That's the UBS dictionary, which is very, you know, mild. They almost tell you nothing. Okay? I like Thayer's the best. Where's Thayer? Here's Thayer. But his entry's real short here. Thayer focuses on etymology, and you can get Thayer for free. Okay, you can download Thayer for free. If you, if you only have one lexicon that you can afford to use, and free is the only price you can afford, get Thayer. I really like BDAG also. BDAG is considered one of the kings of the lexicons. BDAG and Big Kittle are considered two of the best lexicons because they have the most information, most documentation on where these words occur. But if you want to get a quick, real sense of the word, go to Thayer and then use BDAG. Okay? All right. So, Eranontes. Yeah, they're seeking to know. Okay, but they're not seeking to know what person... This is stupid. The word person shouldn't be in any translation. Just kill it. <clears throat> Look, translators are overworked and underpaid. They make mistakes. It's okay that they make mistakes. They're overworked, they're underpaid, and they're stuck in all kinds of political games with the translation committees. That's a fact of life. Okay, you have to be respectable for the translation to com committee to listen to you. And then even if you are respectable, if you come up with a different translation from other translations in the past, the translation committee is going to say no, because then they might not be able to sell the Bible translation. See, it's all big joke translations, big political joke. <clears throat> so, you know, do you care about the Word of God or do you care about politics? That's the test. And it's, it's a nightmare. I feel really sorry, sorry for the, the translators. Because they're not, even if they know something's wrong, like here, that's just plain Greek. What sort of time? That's it. It doesn't mean anything else. It's real clear. The prophets were seeking to know what sort of time would follow Christ's death. That's it. Okay? Real clear. All right, they alone make clear, show, indicate, inform. That's straightforward. Okay, now we come to our next big debate in Christendom. I can't believe people could be so dumb. What is the spirit of Christ? Okay, this can't be too hard to understand. First of all, this is either a subjective or an objective genitive. You've heard me talk about that before. Okay, then there's a third form called a plenary genitive. Okay, but when you're using subjective, objective, and plenary genitive, usually something poetic is intended. Otherwise, it's just a straightforward genitive. Okay, a genitive is like it plays the, the role of an adjective. Okay, an adjective. Now, think about this. Numa means spirit. You'll notice that there's no definite article here. It's an arthritis. So it means the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit. But he's calling himself 
when he's talking to Peter and Peter's writing this out, he's calling himself the Spirit of Christ. Why? Because he's because Christ is dead when Peter writes. The Holy Spirit is calling himself the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit with reference to Christ. See, because that would require the genitive case also. Okay? The Spirit with reference to Christ. The Spirit who's talking about Christ. The Spirit who's, hello, the Spirit of Christ in that Christ is God. Father is God. The Spirit is God. And they're all in the same family because they're all the same nature. Got that? So what's the big whoop here? Why is everybody getting all nervous? Well, is, is does the spirit less than Christ? Oh, come on, people. Can't you think your way out of a paper bag? He's the Holy Spirit, and he chooses to also designate himself as the spirit of Christ as opposed to the spirit of somebody else. Because what does John 16, 9 say? That he will testify what? Concerning Christ. Okay, and how do you communicate concerning? Genitive case, baby. Of, you know, like the book of Hebrews. See, it's a book. What book is it of? What's the content of the book? Hebrews. And what do we say even in English? The book of Hebrews. Of Hebrews modifies like an adjective would the, the noun book. It's not a book of something else. It's the book of Hebrews. Okay, so he's not the spirit of someone else. He's the spirit of Christ. Is this so hard to understand? I mean, there's certain commonalities in language throughout history. Every single language has certain conventions it follows. Okay, so what's, what's the big problem here? Okay, it's an Arthur's construction. There's no definite article here. See, that's a definite article. Okay, another one should be right here. But there isn't one. Because Peter knows his Greek real well, and he's stressing the fact that this is the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, seeking to know, cut this word, seeking to know what sort of, this, this should be translated, what sort of time. And yeah, say the Spirit of Christ in caps like that. Within them, yeah, the Holy Spirit fills you or indwells you. In those days, he filled them. He didn't indwell. The, the Greek word for fill in the Old Testament is pimplemi, and it means to fill up the body like, a good, like food fills up your stomach. It's translated in Hebrew, uh, or the, the original word in Hebrew was sabeah, and it means to fill up your stomach like a good meal. That's how filling worked in the Old Testament. It's different in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's play role, and it means the full filling of your soul. Okay? So, hello, the Spirit within them was indicating, as he, the Holy Spirit, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Okay, now you see this word, glories to follow? Those words aren't in the Greek text. It says here, and the and afterwards the glory. Okay? Meta, Greek word meta, means with or after. Meta tauta in particular means afterwards. That's a phrase that John uses in Revelation to mark off church from tribulation, from millennium, from eternity. Those are like doors. There's two of them in Revelation 4.1 depicting the rapture event. Okay, so to depict the things, the after these things glory would be the best way to, to translate it if you want to keep following the Greek. Okay, even the after these things glory, or after it, this toss is, yeah, after these things glory, doxa is feminine. Okay. So there isn't a word to follow in the Greek. There doesn't actually have to be. And I put out my little video about is there a lacuna here? Because I suspect there is one in this verse. 
but I have no evidence to support that. So either I counted my syllables wrong, and I got to revisit that again, or Peter's saying something other than what I think he's saying in the meter. So it's a major stopping point for me right now. I have to sort of go back to square one. I'm going to keep posting videos on this because they're dealing sort of with other topics related to the same passage. But until I can determine the meter problem here and whether or not, see, like they have to insert it in English, it's implied in the text but not stated. Okay, did Peter have extra words here? And that's what I got to figure out. But hopefully by now I've I've helped you recognize because you're going to run into this somewhere somewhere in your lifetime. The spirit of Christ is the spirit not equal to Christ is he less? Please people, and all you have to answer them is with hi, it's called the book of Hebrews. It's what kind of book? What sort of spirit? The Holy Spirit because is the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit of anybody other than of Christ? Since they're all three God? See, that's all it is. It's an identifier. This is like an identifier. When you say book of Hebrews, you're telling everybody what book it is. Okay? By saying, Numa Christo. Numa Christo. You're saying which spirit it is. It's not the spirits of the demons. It's not the human spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Who is, there's only one Holy Spirit, and he's the spirit of Christ. John 16, 9, the one who's testifying concerning Christ, which also takes the genitive. Okay? That's it. And then the other thing, so just to review real quickly, would the prophets be searching? If they're prophets, they better be better searchers than the rest of us. See, Zaitao, to ask, seek diligently, and search out. Yeah, you search the scriptures, you ask God, and yeah, he'll give you information that's outside. Not necessarily outside, but, you know, what do you want to call it? Complementary to the scripture you got. So you know how to read it better. But the prophets had to, had to be Bible experts. Or they wouldn't be allowed to be prophets. That's why they were appointed as prophets. Daniel was appointed as a prophet because why? Because he knew Bible real well. Jeremiah was appointed as a prophet because why? Because he knew Bible real well. So one of the conditions for even being a prophet, because you had to also teach was that you knew the scripture real well. How do you know scripture real well? By searching it out. Duh! And then, oh, about the grace that will come to you? Yeah, that was a prophecy to the Gentiles. Harvesting the Gentiles was the period directly after Christ's death. That's the way it was supposed to go. That's the way it did go. But in Matthew 16, 18, Christ turned it into church. So it would last longer than 50 years. That's why Daniel 9.26 is so ambiguous on purpose. That's why Daniel kept asking questions. That's why we have Daniel 10 through 12. Because Daniel kept doing this. Exezeteo. Exezeteo. Exezetesan. See? Exezetesan. See? That was what Daniel was doing. We can read it for yourself in Daniel 9. Exeraunesan. Exeraunesan. See, that's what Daniel was doing. He says so in Daniel 9. Yeah, and that's why God made him a prophet and gave him all those prophecies about the future. And then he kept on asking, and that's why we have Daniel 10 through 12. So for all those people who think, oh, P1 Peter 10, 1 10, and 1 Peter 1 11 are difficult passages. Difficult for who? Apparently difficult for them. Not difficult for, you know, Peter. Peter knew what this was. It's real obvious to me too. So why don't you do what the prophets did? Sorry about the fire engine. 
I live near a fire station. You search in the scriptures. Okay? And then God will give you information about what this means. And yes, it is the Old Testament. Sorry to be so harsh. But you know what? The stupidity in Christianity just keeps on shocking me. Every time I think that we can't get dumber, we get dumber. So hopefully, you know, you understand this now. Book, uh, think Book of Hebrews when you see that blue text highlighted. Numa Christu is like Book of Hebrews. Except in Greek, you put the modifier after the noun. So in Greek, it would be, it would be, well, actually, it's the same order. Book of Hebrews. Numa Christu. Spirit of Christ as a distinct from the spirit of some somebody else. Because Christ is God and Father is God and Spirit is God and they're all of each other. Right? Peace out.